to open up with this prayer, John chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me, though were dead, yet shall he live. Verse 26, and whosoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Believest thou this, amen. For we are children of the Most High, amen. Children of the Lord, hallelujah. We must believe and trust in the Lord, amen. Though we may fall, we stumble. We need to get back up. Hallelujah. Don't give up. Put your trust in the Lord. Put your faith in the Lord. Amen. Let us come before the Lord in prayer. Oh, precious Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we come before you, Lord, at this time, my Lord and my God. We praise you and worship you, Lord Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to please bless us this day, my Lord and my God. Open up our hearts and our minds to understand, to receive the word, Lord Jesus. May you bless our pastor, Lord, as he brings forth your word, Lord Jesus. We ask you, Lord, to bless us this day, Lord, and bless those that are on the way, and bless, bless those that are watching online, my Lord and my God. We ask you these things in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen and amen. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. You may have your seats at this time. Hallelujah. We go before the announcements. Our, our scheduled services remain the same. For Sunday service, prayer at 9, 9 a.m., a Christian education at 9.30, and a short break, and then we have our main service at 10.30, and our midweek service Thursdays, prayer at 6.30, and Bible study at 7 p.m. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah, this Sunday, come up, it's Mother's Day, hallelujah. So there'll be no, no Christian education, it'll be the service we starting at 10 a.m., amen? So remember, you know, be good to your mom as we should do every every day, not just on that day. Amen. 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 Our mothers are a blessing unto us. Amen. Okay. Then United Pentecostal Church Micronesia Conference. Amen. General Conference to be this summer. Amen. Starting on Thursday through Sunday, June twenty second through the twenty sixth. So we have our the dates. So prepare ourselves. Most of the classes will be during the day, so if you need to take time off, if you wish to take time off, plan ahead. Amen? Amen. Amen. And that's it for the announcements. We're going to pass it over to our pastor, Pastor Ron. God bless you. Thanks for the mic. Praise the Lord. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate you all so much. You should have a handout in your hand this evening. We have been talking about recovery for the past few weeks. Amen. Who does not need recovery? The, th the first thing we learned in our very first lesson regarding recovery is that there is only one that is perfect, and that is God. And we learned in that lesson there's only one God, and you're not him. So knowing that fact, we all need to recover from something. And so we have been studying recovery. We have been using the word recovery, the acrostic recovery. And each letter, uh, basically every week we are studying a letter. And that letter has significance. So the first week we look at the letter R. And R stood for realize I am not God. I admit that I am powerless to control my tendencies to do the wrong thing. And my life is unmanageable. Week number two, E earnestly believe that God exists, that we matter to him, that he has the power to help us recover. Letter C, consciously choose to commit all our lives and will to Christ's care and control. And then last week we studied O, principle number four, openly examine and confess our faults to ourselves, to God, and to someone else. So tonight... We're going to start with the, uh, with the letter V tonight, principle number five. The scripture says in Matthew chapter five, verse number six, happy are those whose greatest desire is to do what God requires. Okay. So principle number five, voluntarily submit. Everyone say voluntarily. voluntarily. No one here is being forced to do anything. Voluntarily submit to every change. God wants to make in my life. How many of you know that God wants to change us? We never come to God and we never leave the same way. 
right? And every one of us are different. Every one of us, we have a different situation, different circumstance. Voluntarily submit to every change God wants to make in our life. Humbly ask Him to remove my character defects. Anyone here have any character defects? One person? All right. The rest of you will realize you have character defects by the time we're done with the lesson tonight. Praise God. So pay very close attention. Amen. Romans chapter 12, verse number 1 and 2 from the TEV version. So then, my friends, because of God's great mercy to us, I appeal to you. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice to God, dedicated to His service and pleasing to Him. This is the true worship that you should offer. Do not conform yourselves to the standards of this world, but let God transform you inwardly by a complete change of your what? Complete change of your mind. Then you will be able to know the will of God, what is good and pleasing to Him and is perfect. So we have been learning over the course of the last few weeks that we all have hurts. We all have hang-ups that we want to get rid of. We all have habits that we want to overcome, amen? That's why we're studying this topic of recovery. It's not only God's will to, do, to redeem us, uh, redeem our soul for, for eternity, but I believe that it is God's will to redeem our lives now. Come on. I know that in eternity we're going to be perfect, but understand that God wants to help you and I this evening redeem the very best life that we can here and now in this life. God wants the very best in your life now. Amen. And so our text tells us that we are transformed by having our minds changed. Now, unless I can think differently, unless we can, uh, any changes that we make in life is temporary. Okay. So we have to change the way we think. Now, again, how many of you, how many of us have character defects? Okay, we all have character defects. And the question is, number one, where do my character defects come from? You ever wonder where it comes from? Is it the water you drink? <laughs> yeah? No? Scholars would tell us that our character defects come from three primary sources. Number one, biological Number two, sociological. And number three, theological. Okay, uh, Let's say it in an easier way. Where do our character defects come from? Comes from chromosomes, comes from circumstance, and comes from choices. That's where our character defects come from. So let's look at the first one, my chromosomes. How many of you know that your mother and father passed down to each one of you 23,000 chromosomes? <laughs> and you inherited some of their weaknesses and some of their bad habits. Some of you inherited physical defects from your parents. Now, now you know, <laughs> some of you inherited physical attributes from your parents. Now, some of you, I could look at you, and if I know your parents, I can say, wow, that person is a spitting image of their parents, right? Uh, some of you inherited emotional things from your parents. Can I get an amen? amen. Praise God. You... <laughs> You, you didn't come out of the womb the way you are now. You underwent certain things that has shaped and molded your character. So this explains, uh, your chromosomes explains your disposition or predisposition towards certain problems. But let me tell you something, that does not excuse us from sin. For instance, if my... Parents had the tendency of having a bad temper. How many of you had a parent that had a really, really bad temper? Praise God. Amen. I did. I had one parent that, uh, I mean, it was like lighting a dynamite, a stick of dynamite. But that doesn't give me an excuse to go around killing people. Okay. That, that may be part of my chromosome, but that doesn't give me an excuse to sin. For example, if my parents were lazy, that does not give me an excuse to be a lazy person and, not, and doing nothing with my life. Amen? You understand what I'm saying? 
chromosomes are passed down. But it, the, and some people call this generational curses. You know, pastor, some people have asked me over the years, Pastor, do you believe in general, generational curses? Uh, I don't know that I believe in general, generational curses uh, more than I believe that our circumstance, our environment certainly fosters certain kinds of thought patterns and certain kind of behaviors. You understand what I'm saying? So I may have a genetic tendency towards addiction, right? Maybe you, your, your, your parents were addicted. Now, my dad, God bless him, he's already passed away. My dad was an alcoholic. Now, he wasn't a, what you call a drop, you know, fall down, fall over himself kind of alcoholic. He held his alcohol pretty well. But I understand that my dad had that habit. He had that, 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 that tendency. And as a result, when I was growing up, uh, if, the, if the Lord hadn't saved me, I would probably be an alcoholic, which is why I do not drink. Amen. The Bible teaches us that is the, a fool gets drunk. A fool is the one that, that takes strong drink. Some people say, well, but, you know, Pastor, can, can I drink socially? Well, the problem with drinking socially is eventually you'll drink in secret. Once you open the door to certain sin, and if you have a strong tendency to that sin, that door is going to get kicked open. Give an inch, it'll take a yard. Can I get an amen? The only beer that I consume now is ginger beer and root beer. Praise God. Why, Pastor? Why? Why can't I just have a glass of wine? Why can't I, you know, why can't I enjoy, you know, I'm, I'm telling you for myself, that is my tendency. That is my generational curse. That is something that my dad passed on to me. I started drinking at a very early, early age, say 9, 10, 11 years old. Why? Because my dad used to play, have, uh, play mahjong. It's a Chinese uh, poker. And I used to host it, which meant I made all the drinks. I'm not talking about Pepsi and 7-Up. I'm talking about 7-7. I'm talking about all the hard drinks, scotch and, 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 uh, and water and so forth. Well, before I served the drinks, I had to taste it. <laughs> you can imagine after a long night of mahjong, I was buzzed. And I thought, wow, this is... you know, And, and you know, listen... Never mind about that foul-tasting beer. Beer is nasty. I, I didn't get an amen, but beer is nasty. As a beverage, beer is nasty. It tastes like vomit that just was, you know, put in a can. And, and, and the thing about it, the, 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 the problem is the more beers you drink, the less it tastes like vomit. Until you actually eventually vomit because you drank so much, then it tastes about the same. It's nasty. It's a nasty habit. It's a nasty beverage. It's a nasty drink. I prefer to go towards hard alcohol. That was my curse. And had the Lord not saved me, I would, to this, at this very moment, be an alcoholic. I know that in my heart. So we inherit, we inherit certain things, right, from our family, our character defects. Another way that we inherit our character defects is my circumstances, your circumstances. So you were raised a certain way, and you learned a lot of your ways of relating, your preferences, your habits from your parents or from other people. But you learn to respond in certain ways to cover yourself and to handle hurt and rejection a certain way. Now, let's look at, uh, write this down. A lot of your character defects are simply self-defeating attempts to meet unmet needs. Okay. A lot of your character defects are simply self simply self-defeating attempts to meet unmet needs. What that means is everyone has a need for respect. But if you don't get respect early in life, you settle for attention. And you figure it out various ways of getting attention. How do we get attention? We act up. Some of us, we got in trouble. Some of us, we, you know, we, we did certain things, certain behaviors that, hey, hey, attention, attention. No one's paying attention to me. 
Everyone has a legitimate need for love. But if you don't, if you didn't get love as a young person growing up, then you probably will settle for intimate physical relationships as a replacement for love. Okay? Everyone has a legitimate need for security, but if you didn't get security, then some of you turn to materialism. And you say, well, if I buy this and I buy that, then it will, it will soothe my need for security. So how else do we get problems? How, how else do we get character defects? Number three, uh, uh, letter C, we get character defects from our choices, right? So if you choose to do something long enough, it becomes a habit. How many of you knew that? Uh, they say that, uh, psycholo- psychologists say that if you do something for 31 days straight, it becomes a habit. 31 days straight. Not missing. Every day, 31 days straight. So if you do something long enough, it becomes a habit. And once it becomes a habit, you're stuck. See, things never intend to develop in your life. Things that are never intended to develop in your life are created because we have done them so long that it has become a habit. Okay? Write this down. Character defects are often positive qualities taken to an extreme over time because they were misused. Okay? Sow a thought, reap an action. Sow an action, reap a habit. Sow a habit, reap a character. Sow a character and reap a destiny. So the question we need to ask ourselves tonight is, why is it so hard to change the defects in our lives? How many of you want to change? How many of you really, really want to change? How many of you really, really, really? (laughs) Amen. Pretty much just amen hands. Praise God. (laughs) Why is it so hard? Well, A, because we've done them so long. You didn't get your character defects overnight. It took years. That's why you're not going to lose them overnight. Can I get an amen? Oh, see. You didn't learn those habits just over one week or one night. You learned those habits over many, many years. And for you to think that you can somehow get rid of all your bad habits and your defects overnight, well, that's, that's plain foolishness. Amen. Many habits and patterns and responses you developed since your childhood. Amen. They may not be comfortable. They may even be self-defeating, but... Our habits have become familiar. You know, uh, how many of you have that old pair of shoes? That I mean, they're worn out, they're scuffed up. The soles might be already flapping and wanting to eat something. And, and, and can anybody relate to what I'm talking about? My <laughs> my wife, who is not here to defend herself, so I can say this: she'll be back Sunday night. Uh, she has an old pair of orange Crocs that Sister Renee gave us like six or seven years ago when we visited them in Maryland. And my wife, for the life of me, will not to this, in fact, I think she took those uh, shoes with her to Germany this, and I'm talking about those, those orange, and they're, they're like four sizes too big. So when my wife walks around, she's flopping around, I can always tell where she's at. But she will not get rid of those Crocs for the life. I, you know, I bought her at least 20 pairs since then. 20 pairs. She's got 20, maybe even 30. But that orange Croc, sis. I'm like, why do you wear those ugly shoes all over the place? I like them. They're comfortable. They're familiar. <laughs> Praise God. (laughs) She can kill me on uh, Sunday night. Amen. (laughs) Praise God. (laughs) So what are we talking about here? We're talking about 
Uh, we're talking about where do my character defects come from, right? We're talking about why is it so hard to change the defects in our lives? Okay, letter B, because I identify with them, right? Many times we confuse our identity with our character. We say, this is just the way I am. How many of you have said that? This is, this is who I am. This is the way I am. This is the way I was born. This is the way I, I was built. This is the way I am. But you don't have to be that way. What? <laughs> you don't have to be that way. You can change. When you say, this is the way I am, you're associating your identity with your character. You're, ident- you're associating your identity with defeat. In other words, when you say, this is the way I am, you are basically saying, I am defeated because I can't change. And you can change. I can change. We can change. By the power of God. Amen. We don't have to be what we used to be. Amen. We were a different creature than what we are now in Christ Jesus. Amen. I'm no longer the same man that I was when I came to the Lord. I'm not even the same man as I was last week. Complete descendants. It's just like me to blank. Amen. You fill fill that in. I can't fill that in for you. Complete the sentence. It's just like me to be what? A workaholic, undisciplined, worried, be passive, procrastinator. How many of you are procrastinators? Don't no, raise your hand. We don't want to know. <laughs> Amen. How many of you lose your temper? Oh, see, nobody raised their hand, but more people. Yes. No, no, I'm raising my, I'm not asking you to raise your hand. I'm, I'm raising my hand for myself. I, I have a temper problem. Amen. I do have a temper problem. He said, oh, but you're a pastor. <laughs> okay. I'm a pastor with a temper problem. Amen. I, I don't want to have a temper problem. I don't want to get mad. I don't want to get angry. But I'm just, you know, there's a passion in me. You know, when, when, you know I'm, I'm a pretty calm guy. I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty easygoing guy, you know. But once you cross me, once you threaten my family, once you threaten my church, once you threaten my flock, the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the, the Rambo comes out of me. <laughs> Amen. I, 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 will, I will defend you je- jealously to the point where, uh, you know, don't, don't get on my wrong side. Now, that's not a threat. I'm just telling you that I have a problem. Can I get an amen? amen? And don't look at me like I'm pathetic and, oh, what kind of yeah, 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 yeah. Let's get a mirror. <laughs> amen. See, when we say that's just the way I am, we're associating our identity with our defeats. And, and we can't allow that because you're setting yourself up for failure. When you identify yourself with your character defect, what happens? It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm an angry person. I lose my temper. Well, what's going to happen when something happens and you have an opportunity? Why? Because you have already convinced yourself in your mind that that's what you are. You're setting yourself up. It becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. When you say, I'm nervous when I get on planes. Okay, so you've already conditioned your mind. So what happens the next time you get on a plane? The plane is shaking. We're going to crash. Huh? (laughs) Pastor Todd said you order a drink. What he meant by that was a 7-Up or a Pepsi. Right, Pastor Todd? (laughs) You set yourself up because you say, that's who I am. Psychologists tell us that one of the reasons we can't change is that we're afraid. 
Because we, some, some of us are afraid that if I let go of this defect, will, some, will people still like me? Hmm. This has always been a part of me. See, we say, we say these things to ourselves. I've always been like this. See? And so we, 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 it basically becomes a self-fulfilling. I've always been a failure. Well, guess what? You're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. You're going to fail. Why? Because you, in your mind, you've already convinced yourself, I'm always going to fail. I am a failure. Well, let's move on. Why are we having problems? Why, why do we need recovery? Why is it so hard to change the defects in our lives? See, because in, interestingly, defects have payoffs. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but every character defect has a payoff. Because it can mask pain. It gives us an excuse to fail. It may allow us to compensate for guilt. Okay? It may get me attention. It may allow me to control other people. Okay? See, anytime a negative behavior is repeated, even though it's self-destructive, there's always a payoff. We don't do things that we don't get rewarded for. Okay? So in some weird sort of way, our character defect works for us. And so we subconsciously don't want to let go of that particular payoff. So again, we're setting ourselves up for repeated failure. Okay? Why are we having a hard time to change defects in our lives? D, Satan discourages me. That's true. The Bible tells us that Satan is called the accuser of the brethren in Scripture. He's constantly placing negative thoughts in our minds. How many of you have ever had a thought and you wonder, what in the world? Where did that come from? That's Satan planting thoughts in your mind. Now let me tell you something that I learned many, many years ago that really helped me. Being tempted is not sin. But when you act on that thought and that temptation, when you act on it, then it becomes sin. But the fact that it was planted in your brain doesn't mean that you're no good, that you're filthy, that you're, uh, that you're not acceptable. It simply means you're being tempted. Hmm. Satan is constantly putting negative thoughts in our mind. This will never work, he says to us. You can't do it. Who do you think you are? If you think you're going to change, forget it. Other people can change, but not you. You're stuck. It's hopeless. Don't even think about changing. That's what Satan fills our minds with on a daily basis. Because he doesn't want you to change by the power of God. He wants you to remain stuck. Stuck in your problems, stuck in your bad habits, stuck in your past, so that you cannot move forward in your life. Right? And recovery, again, recovery is not just about eternity. Recovery is about now, right here. God wants us to have the best life possible. He wants us to have joy. He wants us to be happy. He wants us to have peace. Amen. Now, not later. Oh, but Pastor, uh, maybe in 50 years from now when I get my act together. (laughs) Guess what? Guess what? That day will never happen. Just because, just because you get your act together this day doesn't mean tomorrow you're going to have your act together. Every day brings new challenges. Every season of life brings new challenges. Amen. What you conquered in your, in your early teens or, or, or early adult life, when you get older, you're going to have different kinds of challenges. When I was young, there was, Pastor Todd, when I was young, there was nothing I couldn't do. I could jump over a wall and run through a troop. Now, I walk around the wall and I tell the troop, hey, excuse me. <laughs> it's frustrating. I'll be honest with you, getting old is frustrating. There's so many things I want to do, but my body says, don't even think about it. The other day, we were working at. Uh, a property down south, and we had to do some work on the roof. I got halfway up there, and I changed my mind. 
My joints were hurting. It's too high. This ladder is too rickety. And I said, yeah, you guys know what to do up there, right? They said, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I said, get up there. The Bible tells us that Satan is a liar. But the Bible also tells us that the truth shall set us free. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Now, how do I cooperate with God? Write this down. How do I cooperate with God's change process? How many of you believe that God wants to change you now? He wants to change us now. Not later. Not tomorrow. Not next week. Not next month. Not next year. Not next decade. Not next century. Paul tells us in Romans to be transformed by what? The renewing of our minds. So my thoughts are the autopilot of my life, right? If you want to change your life, you've got to change the way you think. The Bible teaches us that your thoughts determine your feelings and, and then your feelings determine your actions, right? So imagine yourself on a big lake in a boat, and you set that autopilot for that boat to go east, right? Uh, and so you're on your way. The, uh, the autopilot is pushing you east. But you want to go west. So what you got to do is you got to take that steering wheel. You got to force it to the left because the autopilot instinctively wants to go east because that's where you told it to go. But so you want to you want to change directions. It's like tonight, some of us want to change the direction of our life. We want to fix some defects. We want to fix some bad habits. So we say, oh, no, I want to turn this way. The problem is that you are working with tension and stress. And the minute that you get tired and let go, your boat's going to go east. Why? Because your autopilot is, that's just how you are programmed. And every time you try to change direction, right? You're, you're trying, I want to go west. I want to go west, Pastor. I want to go west. I want to change the direction of my life. I want to change some habits in my life. I want to change defects in my life. And you're, you're struggling. Eventually, you're going to get tired. And you're going to let go of that wheel. And you know what happens when you let go of that wheel? Hey! You can grab the wheel and temporarily force the boat west. But because your autopilot is stuck on going east, the boat is going to go east. Okay? It takes sheer willpower to go opposite of your autopilot in life. And you're always under tension when you try to change things on your own, right? So, what's the problem? The problem is eventually you get tired of trying to change your own life. I want to go west, Pastor. Okay, pull, pull some pressure. Ooh, pull that wheel. Pull that wheel to the left. Well, it may last a day. It may last a week. It may even last a month. But eventually you're going to get tired and when you let go of that wheel, okay, if I really want to change, I have to change my autopilot. What is my autopilot? It's just like me to what? Get angry. It's just like me to fail. It's just like me. Okay, fill in the blank. See, that's your autopilot. You've already trained yourself. You've already trained your mind. Okay? That's your autopilot. So your thoughts are your autopilot. Okay? We've got to change the way we think. There's seven ways we can change the way we think. Okay? Let's look at A. Write this down. Focus on changing one defect at a time. Okay? Proverbs 17, 24 says... An intelligent person aims at wise action. But a fool starts off in many directions. Okay? We want to change our thinking. How do we do that? We focus on one problem at a time. Okay? Some people say, oh, Pastor, I really love this. Uh, I really love this recovery series. I got to change this. 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 I got to change I got 50 things I want to change. Don't even think about it. Okay, why? Because when you try to tackle too many things in your life, you end up failing at everything in your life. 
I don't know who said it, but they said it best. You can do 10 things poorly, or you can do one thing very well. Okay? An intelligent person aims at wise action, but a fool starts off in many directions. Right? Don't let yourself become overwhelmed and discouraged because you'll end up not changing anything. I want to change this. 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 I want to change. Change. You're just all over the place. You ever gone to a gun range and shot your gun like that? You're not going to hit anything. So many targets. Oh, there's, oh, there's, big, 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 big. You have to be specific. God, this is what I want to work on right now. Just this one thing. Everyone say one. Amen. You have to be focused. You can't change everything in your life all at one time. It's impossible. You can try, but you're going to fail because you are shooting everywhere and not hitting anything. One problem at a time. Go to prayer. Go to, go, go to the Lord in prayer and ask Him to show you which one is the most damaging in your life. And then address that one first. One defect at a time. Or else it won't work. B. Okay, how do we... How do we work in union with God to overcome our problems? Seven ways to change our thinking. Okay. B, focus on one victory at a time. Matthew chapter 6, verse 11. Give us this day our daily bread. Not give us this week, not give us this month, not give us this year. Give us this day. Okay. Focus on the day. Give us this day our daily bread. God wants to, will give you enough strength for this day. Everyone say this day. The Lord said you can't do anything about your past and don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough problems of its own. You focus on today. I will give you strength for today. Focus. God will give you enough strength to change for one day, not one year, not for the rest of your life or eternity. He wants you to take it one day at a time so you will trust him. Okay. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Some of you have elephants in your lives. Pastor, how am I going to deal with this elephant? Well, that's one bite down. You've got two more thousand to go. Well, that's okay. The next day, amen. Tomorrow, some of you are going to be waking up. If your family was not here for this Bible study, they will not understand what you are doing. But symbolically, I'm taking a bite out of my defects, out of my problems, out of my circumstances. Amen. Your, your, your spouse may think you turn into a zombie. You didn't create your problems overnight, so don't try to conquer them overnight. Break down these problems into bite-sized pieces and work on it one day at a time with God's help. Lord, for this day, I want to fill in the blank. Lord, for today, I want to remain calm during traffic. You know, it doesn't help that, that, that I keep getting rear-ended. Makes me mad. Here I am, a nice citizen, sitting. <laughs> sitting at the stoplight because I'm, I, I, I'm a law-abiding citizen. It turned red. Now, I know for, you, for some people that doesn't mean much. But here on Guam, when it turns red, that means six more cars can go. <laughs> but no. I, <laughs> God has changed me. It doesn't help, but I am sitting there as a good citizen. I am observing. And then all of a sudden, in the serenity and calmness, (laughs) 
This last time I got rear-ended, I prayed. I said, Lord. Don't let me kill this idiot. <laughs> and forgive me, Lord, for thinking of that way, but at the time, that's what I felt. I said, this guy he must either be drunk or he must be blind. Because everybody stopped. Everybody stopped. But I'm the one that got hit. <laughs> you guys ever heard about the Filipino that went to the States for the very first time? Never drove on the freeway, right? So he's getting uh, on the, what they call the on-ramp. So he's, he's, he's coming off of the uh, arterial road. He's going on the main freeway. And while he's going down the, uh, the on-ramp, he's screaming at the top of the, yeah! Ha! Ha! And then he tr- tries to merge into traffic, and he almost causes an accident. There's a cop there. He pulls him over, and he says to the, to, he says to the Filipino guys, hey, what's wrong with you? He said, you, you didn't yield. And the Filipino man said, but sir, up a sir, I yield and I yield, but nobody heard me. <laughs> I know. <laughs> that's a racist joke. But that's the only way I could deal with, with some of my problems. <laughs> Lord, oh Lord, I yielded, I yielded, but this guy still hit me. What the smack, yo. <laughs> Amen. That's not in my notes. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to deal, okay, with my own problems. <laughs> Lord, for this day, I want to remain calm. I want to have peace. I want to have joy. Uh, wh- whatever it is, you fill in the blank. Lord, this day, uh, just this, just this day. Don't worry about tomorrow. Don't worry about next week. Don't worry about next month. Don't worry, don't worry about yesterday because there's nothing you can do. For this day, Lord, I want to stop drinking. Give, give me the strength, Lord, for this day, just today. I don't want to pick up another can of beer or consume alcohol. For this day, Lord, please help me not to smoke another cigarette. For this day, just this one day. Matthew chapter 6, verse 34 from the MES version. Give me your entire attention. Or give your entire attention to God, to what God is doing right now. And don't get worked up about what may or may not happen tomorrow. How many of you ever worry about what may or may happen or may not happen tomorrow? God will help you deal with whatever hard things come up now. So as you're working through your problems, thank God every day for every victory. No matter how small. Okay? Letter C, focus on God's power, not willpower. Okay, it's very important. Focus on God's power. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. Now, there are certain things that we can do ourselves, but we are going to fail eventually. Like I said, autopilot's going this way. We want to turn the ship this way. It's a lot of tension. It's a lot of work. And eventually, we're going to get tired. So I don't want to smoke. 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 But eventually, we get tired. <sighs> I told you about my brother. My brother wanted so badly to quit smoking. I don't know a smoker that doesn't want to stop smoking. So he tried everything. Man, he tried the patches. He had patches all over his body. I thought he had eczema. He had patches. Oh, he tried this. He tried that. He tried that. One day he comes to me. Hey, he said, hey, bro. Yeah, I fi- I, I'm going to quit smoking. I figured out a way to sm- quit smoking. I said, really? Uh, and I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, I'm going to a hypnotist. Right? Going to a hypnotist. It's going to hypnotize me. Don't smoke. Don't smoke. Don't smoke. So I said, whoa. I said, well, God bless you, bro. I hope it works. A week later, well, what happened with hypnotist? Bro, didn't work. (laughs) But if your mind is unchanged, 
your track. It's your autopilot. Your mind has to be changed. Focus on God's power, not willpower. Jeremiah 13, 23 says, Can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin? Or a leopard take away his spots? Nor can you who are so used to doing evil now start being good. Wow, that's an amazing verse. You should write that down. We know willpower is not enough, right? Because if willpower worked, then none of us would need to be here. Ever think about that? If willpower worked, none of us would have to go to church. None of us would ever have to pray. If willpower worked. Because we would already be changed. Amen. In fact, depending on your own strength actually blocks recovery in your life. But here's the good news. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13. There is nothing I cannot master with the help of the one who gives me strength. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There's, there's our hope right there. There is nothing that I cannot master with the help of the one who gives me strength. Okay. So what are we talking about? Let's focus on what I write this down. Focus on what I want, not on what I don't want. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 8. Fix your thoughts on what is true, good, and right. Think about the uh, things that are pure, lovely, and dwell on the fine, good things in others. Think about all you can praise God for and be glad about it. Okay? What you focus on is what you move towards. Okay, what you focus on. Wherever you set your eyes, that's the direction your body's going to follow. Okay, so it, it, it applies with you know, driving your car. If you're driving your car in a certain direction, wherever your eyes are, that's where your car is going to go. When you shoot a gun, wherever you p- fix your eyes, that's where the bullet's going to go. When you play golf... This, uh, this rule does not apply. <laughs> At least for me. <laughs> Amen. I, want, I tell my boy, hey, I want to go that way. And I get up there and I'm, oh yeah, boy, come on. And whack. Let me try that again. Mulligan. Whack. <sighs> Whatever you, you focus on is what dominates your life. Write this down. Whatever has your attention has you. So what is it, whatever it is that you are focusing on, that's where you're going to head. So if you're, if you're focusing on a miserable problem in your life, and that's all you're focused on, well, guess what? That's where you're going to end up in that miserable situation because that's what you're concentrating on. That's what you're focusing on. That's what you're staring at. That's, what, that's all you can see. Problem, 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 problem. Until you change your mind about that, until you change your focus, you're going to be stuck in that problem. Amen. Not once does the Bible command us to resist temptation. Now, this is interesting, right? Why? Because whatever you resist will persist. The harder you push against it, the harder it pushes back. The Bible does tell us to resist the devil and he will flee. Okay? Instead of resisting, the Bible teaches us to refocus. Don't just sit there and say, I don't want this. Turn the mental challenge channel in your mind. Turn the channel. Turn the channel. Amen. This is the power of affirming God's word. Right? There are over 7,000 promises in the Bible for us to claim. Amen. Saturate your mind with the things of God. For example, music. How how many of you know that music has a very powerful effect on your spirit and soul? Okay? So if you listen to music... By the way, you know, when I was growing up, I thought, oh, that's a nice song. Oh, that's a nice song. I used to listen to a lot of Barry Manilow songs. 
you know, and I used to, you know. And then years later, after I've been serving the Lord for some years, I thought, I told, I told him, hey, let's get, let's get a Barry Manilow, uh, you know, uh, cassette tape. I don't know what it's a cassette tape or C. Let's listen to those songs and let's reminisce about our, our romance and let's light that fire. Well, I played the first song and he was talking about, oh, Mandy, Mandy. He's talking about Mandy, right? But Mandy's gone. He said, he's with somebody else. I'm like, what? <laughs> listen, to those, listen to some of those old romantic songs. They're pretty, they're pretty depressing. Right? Yeah. You left, you, you picked the fine time to leave me, Lucy. <laughs> for hun- I, I know he said four hungry children, but I thought it was 400 children. Holy cow! Four hundred children and a crop in the field. I've had some bad times. Lived through some sad times. But this time your hurting won't heal. <laughs> oh, if I listen to some of those country songs, man, I'm jumping off the next building. They're just downright depressing. Only thing worse than... Only thing worse than some of those country songs are the rap songs. Shoot your mother. Shoot your grandmother. What the? (laughs) Slap your auntie. Kick the baby. I'm like, shut that devil music off. Go back to Kenny Rogers. You pick the pine (laughs) time. (laughs) <laughs> Let me tell you something. Listen to some good gospel music. Because it'll focus your mind on Jesus. It'll focus your mind on the Lord. Amen. And it will not. <laughs> Amen. Do yourself a favor. Change the channel. Hallelujah. Praise God. Focus on doing good, not feeling good. Galatians chapter 5 verse 16. Live your life as your spiritual nature directs you. Then you will never follow through on what your corrupt nature wants. So focus on doing good, not on feeling good. If you do the right thing, your feelings will eventually catch up. Right? Sometimes doing the right thing doesn't really, your heart's not really into it. Oh, you know, I know I want to do the right thing, but my heart's not in it. Because, you know... <laughs> Doing evil sometimes feels good. It's in Scripture. The, the Bible tells us that Moses chose to suffer with the children of God than to enjoy sin for a season. Hmm. But if you wait until you feel like changing, you'll never change anything because the devil will make sure you never feel like it. It's always easier to act on your way into feeling than to feel your way into action. Okay? In other words, fake it till you make it. <laughs> you never thought you'd hear, hear that across the pulpit. Fake it till you make it. Amen. It may feel awkward, maybe even terrible when you begin to change. Why? Because you're so used to feeling abnormal that you don't know what it means to be normal. F. Write this down. Focus on people who help you and not hinder you. Focus on people who will help you and not hinder you. Focus on people who will help you and not hinder you. Amen. In other words... Ask yourselves, who am I hanging around with and what are these people doing and contributing into my life that makes me a better person? If you are hanging around with the wrong crowd, change the channel. Change the crowd. Change the environment. I need an amen. 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, don't be fooled. Bad friends will ruin good habits. 
I don't care how strong you are in the Lord. I don't care that you're filled with the Holy Ghost. I don't care that you've been going to church all your life. You hang around with the wrong people. They will eventually turn your autopilot in the wrong direction. Oh, praise God. I cannot overemphasize this part enough. 1 Corinthians 15, 33. Do not be fooled. Bad friends will ruin good habits. Bad friends, bad acquaintances, bad influences. Amen. I don't care how important they are. I don't care what titles they carry. I don't care how, you know, this or that. If they steer you in the wrong direction. And by the way, let me just tell you, that can also include other Christians. Not other Christians. Every Christian is perfect and holy. (laughs) You got to be careful about the people in church. Just as much as you have to be careful about people outside church. Because there are people in church that are gossipy. Of course, they don't call it gossip. They call them prayer requests. Hey, my Lamont. Hey, can you pray for sister so-and-so? Because, hey, that girl, she got bunions. (laughs) By the way, if if you have bunions, don't be offended. I have one too. If we put all our bunions together, we could have a stew. (laughs) Focus on people who will help you, not hinder you. Amen. If you don't want to get stung, stay away from bees. Don't hang around people and things that mess you up. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 verse number 12. Let's close it up. And one standing alone can be attacked and defeated. But two can stand back to back and conquer. Three is even better. For a triple cord, braided cord is not easily broken. Praise God. Hallelujah. So what I'm saying is you can't recover on your own. You recover. Generally, we recover in a relationship. Amen. When, our, when we're accountable to someone else. Amen. If you're, for example, if you're having problems with pornography, ask someone that you have confidence with and have Trust in. Say, hey, I'm really struggling with this problem. Can you help me? I want to be accountable to you. Can you change the password on my, on my, uh, on my computer or the settings so that I cannot look at illicit material without ha- get, having you override it for me? Because recovery happens in relationship. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron... So people can improve each other. Now here's another one. This is really good. Write this down. G. Focus on progress, not perfection. Focus on progress, not perfection. Philippians chapter 1 verse number 6. And I am sure that God who began the good work within you will keep right on helping you grow in His grace until His task within you is finally finished. On that day when Jesus Christ returns. Some of you have been going to church for years. Pastor, man, I've been going to church for years. But sometimes it feels like I haven't really made much, much progress. Don't worry, you have. You just can't readily recognize it. But God is helping you every step of the way. Amen. Don't, don't give up and say, well, I'm not going to go to church anymore. Why? Because I'm not perfect and I, I can't overcome a lot of things in my life. Well, you're still a work in progress. Remember, you, you learned these things. You picked up these bad habits over the course of years. It's going to take God sometimes. Now, God can, he can instantly heal some of us of certain things right away. Right? When I came to the altar, there were certain things that God healed me of right away. Then there's other things that It's taking time. And he's still working on me. Mm -hmm. 
God, I have an anger problem. Did I get victory over it the day that I gave my life to the Lord in 1982? No. Did I have a problem with it last month? Yes. Did I have a problem with it last week? Yes. Does that mean that I have made no progress at all? That I'm just hopeless and that I'm just a failure? No, that doesn't mean that. It means that there's some things that I've overcome in my life that I don't have to worry about. I've got victory over those things. For example, I don't want to smoke anymore. When I was in junior high and high school, you know, and I only smoked because all the cool kids smoked. Right? And that's how we all start. Hey, bro, you want, hey, you want to smoke? Oh, yeah, yeah, come on. <laughs> right? But then, you know, after a couple, two, three, you know. Okay. Right? Then, but then, then you don't realize, but later on, you're addicted to that stuff. Your body, <gasps> hey, that, that's, too cl- that's too clean. Get, get some cigarette. <laughs> Oh, that feels better. <laughs> Funny story. <clears throat> I'd been living for the Lord for several years. And one day, out of nowhere, I woke up. I mean, this just came out of left field. I woke up, and I had the strongest urge to smoke a cigarette. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm in ministry. I'm a pastor. You know, I'm... <laughs> Can you imagine me leaning over my, my, my dresser and grabbing a cigarette and my wife staring? <sighs> I just had an urge. What that means is that even though there are some dormant things in your life, Satan will try to resurrect those things. How many of you remember that, that old movie? Uh, what was that movie called? Carrie. How many of you remember the old movie Carrie? Right? So Carrie, you know, she, she was being picked on. She was being bullied. And, you know, they had the prom and all the blood. <laughs> Screaming, dying, yelling. And finally, Carrie died. And so the last scene in that movie, guys, I still remember it to this day. The last scene in that movie... It was a nice, beautiful, sunny day. The birds, the sun was out, and the the, the camera was panning on the cemetery. And it was focusing, it it, it kept getting closer, and it was focusing on Carrie's grave, Carrie's tombstone, and there was flowers on on the thing, real quiet, real serene, you know. And everybody was like, oh. Boom! My hand came out of the grave. Ah! And that's how the movie ended. And I had to walk home. (laughs) By by myself. In the dark. (laughs) Same thing happened to me when I watched The Exorcist. I went with six of my friends. Dudes, come on, man, let's go watch. Let's go watch Exorcist. Come on, man, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's go watch. Because my sisters had watched Exorcist the week before. And when they got home that night, they turned on all the lights in the house. And they got every crucifix that my mom owned, which was like a lot. And they put it around the bed. And they had all the boys sleep around them that night. I thought, what is up? Exorcist. So the next week. Me and my buddies, come on, man, let's, come on, let's go. <laughs> We're sitting there. Her head's turning, oh, holy cow. Green vomit. I'm like, oh. Hey, make a long story short. At the end of the movie, I looked around, and they were all gone. And I thought, because see, one, one by one, hey, hey, Ron, I'm going to go get popcorn, okay? 
Boom. They never came back. Hey, Ron, I'm going to use the bathroom, bro. Okay, go. Cool. They never came back. They all booked it home. I'm the only one that watched it by myself. And I had to walk home that night by myself. (laughs) Now, some of you are thinking, see, understand that recovery is a decision followed by a process. So you've got to change your mind first. Then the process begins of changing. You know, what you think is not what you are. What you think is what you will eventually become with the help of the Lord. But it's not going to happen overnight. Just because you think it does not make it a reality. By thinking it, you're changing your process and you're changing your focus. Now understand, recovery is a decision. Write that down. Followed by process. Now some of you may be thinking... Well, God will only really love you when you get a cert- to a certain stage in your life and you have conquered certain problems. And that is absolutely wrong. God loves you at every stage of your life, regardless. I want to say that again. You don't have to get perfect to get God. You get God and he will make you perfect. You don't have to be good for God to love you. So a lot of us, we are preconditioned because of our chromosomes to think, well, God will only love me if I get straight A's. God will only love me if I do this. God will only love me if I live right. God will only love me if I have a success. That is absolutely false. God loves you every stage in your spiritual growth. Write this down. God will never love you any more than he does now, right now. And God will never love you less than he does right now. Now that should bring comfort to all of us this evening. A wise and loving parent. And by the way, this Saturday, uh, Sunday is what? Oh, hallelujah. Men, children... That means mom gets the day off. That, mean mom, that means mom doesn't have to clean the house. You should all clean the house Saturday night. That means mom doesn't have to cook all day Sunday. That means mom do- doesn't have to clean up after you or do anything for you. Mom is going to be a queen at least for one day. Now, she should, you, you should do that every day. Now, I know what some of you men are thinking. She's not my mom. Remember that on Father's Day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I tried that one time. I tried that many years ago. My wife said, hey, don't forget, next Sunday's Mother's Day. I said, you're not my mom. I made that mistake one time in my life. <laughs> A wise and loving parent enjoy their children at every stage of their development. I loved my children when they were tiny little infants. I loved my children when they were toddlers and first learning how to crawl and walk. And oh, they're so cute! They're so cute! Ooh, we're good day. We're good day. Oh. And then they grew up older. They running around. Oh, made me tired. <laughs> then they became teenagers. I love my children in every stage of their life. God loves us in every stage of our life. Whether we're high or low, whether we're good or bad, God loves us unconditionally. Like parents, he knows what it's like to be a good father. He knows that, hey, I'm going to love that child even if they're living in disobedience, even if they're not doing the right thing, even if they are messing up their life. I still love them. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. 
He loves you when you're right. He loves you when you're wrong. He loves you when you're weak. He loves you when you're strong. He'll never change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Why? For God is love. Praise God. Recovery! Amen. I want to encourage you to keep all the lessons on this recovery series in a folder because I guarantee you're going to have to come back to it at some point in your life. Rather than calling me saying, Pastor, what was lesson number three of recovery 10 years ago? I don't know. Keep your notes. Go back over it because this will help you to understand. When you fall, get back up. Recovery. When you make a mistake, get back up. Recovery. Amen. When, you've gone, you, when you find yourself have strayed, you're going east again. When you want to go west, amen. Go over these notes and say, Lord, help me change my mind and my focus. Amen. Let's all stand. Praise God. Sunday, Mother's Day. Biba, Mama. Spoil your, the ladies in your life. Take them to a restaurant. If you can't afford a restaurant, make a restaurant in your house. Amen. But do something special. Praise God. My wife will not be home until 1030 Sunday night, which means she only has an hour and a half left of Mother's Day. <laughs> and she, she, said, she said, babe, because I, I booked her flight. Of course, I don't look at dates. I just like, okay, you am going to leave on the 8th of, you know, of April, and you'll be back, uh, back a month later, right? She said, babe, you booked me to come back on Mother's Day. I'm going to be in the air on Mother's Day. I said, hey, I didn't do that on purpose. You know, I just looked at the calendar and said, one month, boom. So <laughs> she only has an hour and a, hour and a half. If she gets her luggage quickly, she, she might have a good hour of Mother's Day. But I, I, I messaged her today. I said, sweetheart, don't worry. We're going to celebrate Mother's Day on Monday. I said, I have made reservations at Subake. See, the thing I really love about Mother's Day, I get to celebrate too. <laughs> so what I really am saying is... We're going to eat good. If you get a chance, message Sister Tina on Monday. Because she won't get your messages on Sunday. (laughs) She'll be in the air. But message her and tell her how much you appreciate her. She's the first lady of our church. Amen. And I appreciate her. She's just been such a blessing to me and to my family. But, uh, you know, just let her know that you appreciate her. Send her a Mother's Day on Monday. Praise God. God is good. How many of you want to recover? How many of you believe we can recover? In Jesus' name, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you and thank you tonight. Thank you for your word that gives us wisdom and understanding. And Lord, we need your help. We need your help to change the way we think about things, the way that we think about life, the way we think about sin, the way we think about recovery. Just because I think it, it will not be. I must think it. And I must pray, and I, might, and I must ask for direction and guidance and power to do the right thing. So, Father, would you please help us bless the remainder of this week, and especially bless all of our moms this coming Sunday, Lord, as we gather together to celebrate a beautiful Mother's Day. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would just be with us, lead us, and guide us. Bring, it back, bring us back at the appointed time, should you tarry. In Jesus' precious name we pray, and everyone said amen. amen. God bless you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.